Hello, folks, or should I say, Guten Tag, Ola, Oloha, because today we are translating your game. And I have to say, I am super excited to be bringing you guys this tutorial. I remember the first time my game started to be played by people from other countries, people with other languages. And immediately, we got hit with one-star reviews from across the world. One star, donde esta el español? One star, solo inglés? Por qué? One star, mierda! Stuff like that is gonna happen to your game as you cross the border. And what we're gonna need to do is set your game up for success regardless of the culture that it is played within. And folks, that starts with translations, one of the most important part of a localization path for your game. Today, we will be using a comma separated value. Check it out. This is, of course, the CSV you've known and loved since you were in grade school. A comma separated value sheet looks like this, something akin to what you might see in Microsoft Excel. Uh, there's, I think it's called numbers for the Apple computers and also available in Google Sheets. Now, we're gonna be using Google Sheets for this tutorial, but you can host this CSV wherever you should desire. If that's AWS, if that's Dropbox, this is all gonna work for us today, folks. However, I have to tell you, I highly recommend Google Sheets for one superpower that it's gonna bring to the table. Let me explain. Google, as you may know, is the search giant. The King Daddy when it comes not only to search but also to Google Translate. And we can actually leverage that amazing pipeline of translational goodness in order to get ourselves the first step towards translating our game. Now, Google Translate may make a grammatical error here and there. However, this is a huge leap and bound from starting from scratch if you're going to be sending this to a translator in order to check or revise. That can save them a ton of time. And if you're on the shoestring budget, you can't afford a translator, which I totally understand. They're a little expensive right now. Then, hey, a poor a Google translation is better than nothing, folks. It's better than nothing. So let me tell you how you're going to go about this. You're going to make a column for each one of the languages you want you want to support. The one on the left hand side, that column is going to be your English column. Type anything that you need in your game on the left hand side, right? Each row is its own term basically. If there's going to be a line of text that appears in your game on its own, that's going to be its own row. And then across the row, that's going to be the translations for each language. So for example, nope in English is nope, but in French it's non, in Italian it's no, and in German it's ni. All right, so in order to get that translation, you're going to push, follow along with me folks, you're going to push equals. Then I believe it's translate, no, Google Translate, there we go. Then we're going to show the source text. Then we're going to show the source language. This is the source language code, which in this case is going to be EN. That stands for English. And then the target language code. So in this case, uh, where are we? I think the German column, that's going to be DE, which stands for German. Push enter. It will say loading for a period of time, and then, if we're lucky, it will replace it with the knee. Awesome. So that is exactly what I did for this entire sheet. However, you don't want to leave it like that. See, it's in a formulaic form right now, okay? It's got that equal sign. It is computing knee. Instead, we want to replace it with a raw string so that this form, this field right here, instead of saying equals Google Translate, all this stuff, instead it will just say that raw text knee. So for that, there's one additional step where we're going to copy it and paste it. Nope, that did not work. Okay, in that case, hmm. Well, what we could do is maybe copy and paste special value only. There we go. Okay, that's exactly what we needed. And now instead of that equals, it is just the raw text. That's going to be important for when we're downloading it. We don't want to be down downloading the parametric form. Okay, wonderful. That is all we need to do in order to set up this sheet. You should also make it publicly viewable, right? Anyone with this link can view, which I think you could do just by copying this. Another note, I am going to be version controlling these sheets in such a way that if we are not able to download the latest version, we can revert back to the previous version. And for that, I've created a system where in the top left here, we're just going to type the current version number equals English. So preceding that English term, we are going to say the current version number equals English. So if we want to update this, we did just change a term after all, you're going to change that to a 16, and that is what the revision process looks like. 
Now, a few other notes while we're on the CSV. I would say that in my experience, when I'm sending this to translators, I generally don't give them the live version. So, for example, I'm working uh, with a corporation right now, and, and we're going to be doing a, a review where all the translators help translate the terms. In order to make that happen, what I have done is I've made a similar sheet. I've cloned this sheet. And then in that sheet, they can edit the terms and update the boxes as necessary. And I've also gone with a color scheme for that. So I say to them, hey, if you go to a box and it looks good, I want you to just flag it green. And if you need to edit a box and you've updated the text inside, just flag it yellow or something like that. That way, at a quick glance, you could see which parts of those um, uh, which parts of those translations need to be tr need to be picked up and put into your live document. So I do recommend you have a live document and you have one that people can edit if the translators want to update it for you there. So with that, we've completed the CSV section and we're going to jump now into some Unity code. All right, folks, that's enough of that silly design nonsense. We're about to jump into what we all came for today, folks. We're ready to jump into the code. And there is a reason they call me the Oprah of game development. And that's because just like that show Oprah, where you look under your chair and find a wonderful little goodie bag, look under this video in the description and you will find a little gift for you. That's right, folks. It is a link to the source code in the description of this video. Video, a record breaker for different scripts we're going to be covering today, which will allow us to integrate this pipeline into the Unity game engine. Again, Unity is just one of many game engines, and this is one that we're going to be using for the example, but this would work just as well in any other game engine of your choice. Now, the first script we're going to be talking about is termdata.cs. This is a static class, and it's going to be used exclusively for converting that CSV formatted data into a format that we can use and make sense of a little bit faster at runtime. And we're going to be using, of course, the .NET hashing system here using a dictionary for quick find and replace. So here's what that looks like. We're going to first have a dictionary of language indices, which will tell us, given a certain language, what is the corresponding index. So in uh, this is, I actually don't think I use this in this particular source code, but this is really helpful if you want to populate a field telling players all the different language options that are available. And if they choose Spanish, it will then save in the code, okay, Spanish is what language index is Spanish? So that will either be the zeroth language index or the first language index. And that index corresponds to which column is it inside this sheet. That way it knows which column to look inside when it's trying to find that data. So that is what these index is for. And this will make a little bit more sense when we go through some examples. Uh, and then the next thing is the terms translation data. So that is going to be a dictionary which relates the English text to the different translations for that English text. So if we knew our current language index was zero, which would correspond to the French text here, we would look up the word we need to translate, nope. We would find this array of translations, and then we would choose the French or the zeroth index translation, which in this case would be non. So that's sort of how that works. And likewise, uh, since there is not, since we're not going to have English in this array, in fact, it's not a value for this dictionary. It's, it's actually the key for this dictionary. Whenever they have a language index that is English, that is going to be negative 1. So the language index of negative 1 corresponds to English. 0 corresponds to French in this case. And then the next one's Italian. So that's what the term data looks like. And that's how we're going to be using that in code with the translation loader. So let's jump into that. The translation loader is a mono behavior which sole purpose is going to be to download that CSV sheet and convert it into the term data format we just saw. It's actually going to be doing this by downloading that CSV, which is huge. This is tremendous, folks, and let me tell you why. When you're developing a mobile game like Android or iOS, and you want to make a change and upload it through the standard review process, that could easily take three days to even a week if you have the misfortune of creating an iPhone game. They are very slow. Apple, as we know, in many ways is very slow. But that is a problem for us because if we have a typo, we don't want to go through that crazy revision process. This system will allow us to just edit the CSV, change the version, and then the next time they open the app, they'll be downloading the CSV separate from the app download. So this is huge because it's going to allow us to have way faster iteration times when we're going to be changing things 
like translations. And this is actually a principle I'd love for you to apply further in your gameplay engineering and gameplay development because in general we don't want to be doing a, a full push we want to be doing these live updates and moving in this direction is going to allow us to just decrease iteration times and allow you to get the best content in the hands of players better faster stronger everything awesome okay so the translation loader this is going to start a code routine with a csv downloader wow okay so we're actually gonna need five scripts let's pop open the csv downloader for you there so the csv downloader has the Google Sheet doc ID. Now you will find this right here, okay? That's your doc ID. Oh, can't see it. Let's pull it over here. This is the doc ID. It's up here in the URL, okay? You're just gonna wanna paste that in there. And uh, basically it's gonna construct the URL using that doc ID. Okay, that's how that works. And I even have the comment here for my Google Sheet so you can see what that looks like. Now, we're gonna start with an I enumerator. Let's jump back to the coding view. The I enumerator is going to be downloading this data. It's going to start that download. It's also going to have some catches here in case it runs into an error. And if it does successfully download that data, it's going to save it in a shorthand, the text and the data itself, into a player pref string. This is, of course, a, a quick way for you to save things in Unity. And what's great about that is if we do fail a download, if we're subsequently trying to download, we will be able to revert back to our last downloaded version. And this already does all that automatically where it basically says, hey, you know, the last we, we ran into an error, here's the error, and we're going to set the download data to our last downloaded data version there. Okay, so that's really useful in case maybe they download the app and start playing it, but then they go, who knows, in an airplane and they don't have any internet access and want to keep playing the game. So that's how that works. And then uh, we have a callback for uncompleted. Uh, there's one little helper method here, which is going to extract the equals index in the case where we have, you know, um, version 16 equals English. That's going to be pulling out the, uh, the number there for us. So that's how that works. And let us jump back into the translation loader now that we've covered the, the term data and the CSV loader. So we started the coroutine for the CSV loader, and now we're going to go to the after download method. Let's pop that open, folks, on line 21. Okay, cool. So if there was an error, it's going to display an error. This is actually a great place for you to show a notification to your user if you'd like. And otherwise, we're going to continue and process the data. So let's jump into that. Here we go. We're processing the data here. And we're going to wait. Um, but this is really nice so that you can let all your displays load, particularly if, if you have your translation loading in the beginning of your game. You're going to want all of your other visuals to load before you pause uh, and start loading this stuff. Also, you could do a side load so that you can have a loading screen visual at the same time. Otherwise, it is going to appear like your game is frozen. So to each their own there. But uh, the general principle here is we're going to be parsing through the CSV. Now, I actually covered this in a previous tutorial for translations um, for uh, no, no, no. It was uh, for Unity to Twine. However, I'll just go through this briefly. We're going to be running through each one of the lines here um, and we're going to be basically separating the comma separated value and parsing it out into a string list. Then at some point, we're going to be taking this string list and I believe uh, we'll be popping it into the term, here we go, into the term data object that we spoke of before. So in this case, I have a globally accessible term data um, method in my service locator, which is a tutorial I just went over. However, you can save this data wherever you would like. And basically, you're just pulling it out and, and saving it into a place that works well for you. And then after you've processed that data, which again is simply converting it from a CSV format into this uh, term data format, we're going to go into the after process data message here. And after process data is going to have a string here. So uh, repeatedly, you'll see that I am using um, uh, sort of these calls which wait. Okay, It's important that we do this because uh, this could take an unknown amount of time, and we also do want to allow the other, um, the other processes, the other processors to have some, some compile time so they could do other things, some run time so that they can do other things while we're doing this. So what I have here is I have a system where we have a system.action string, which is basically a callback function. And whenever I have this, the paradigm is if you're returning a string, it's an error message. So when you return the system.action, if it's null, then that basically means there's no problem. But if there is a string being returned, then that's an error message. So that's just the principle going on there. And then we have a callback. So um, 
That is it for now. There's some other items here. So this is actually just a smaller section where we're going to be, so this is a helper method called within the processing data where we're gonna be processing a specific line. And what this does is it basically pulls out a single line and it determines whether or not this is English, in which case we need to create a new key for a dictionary, or if it's not English, which in which case it will call it a normal node, which is basically uh, all the other translations and it will be slowly compiling a dictionary. So that's what it's doing here. Okay, cool. So that's that. Now, there is actually some other helper methods that I thought would be useful to include for you here. I've given them both the prefix debug, so you know they're not used in production, or they're, they're not really used while we're creating, they're not used while we're running the game, but they are used while we're creating the game, if that makes sense. And so, what these methods do is they're there to collect all of your term data. So, if you, like me, maybe designed your game thinking about translations but not doing a lot of work for them, it can be a bit of a pain in the neck to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to create a spreadsheet with all the English terms on the left-hand side here. And the way that I've done this is I've instead created a little helper method which will cultivate all of those terms that are used in your game so that we have a list of all the English text or whatever language you coded it in. And so what that looks like here is, in this case, I'm going to be going through all of my dialogue. Uh, now, you probably won't have a dialogue object because I'm using a, a separate thing from my Twine, from my Unity to Twine tutorial. But whatever the format is that you're using this text, you can use a similar paradigm here where you're going to be putting in all of those strings through your translation system. And similarly here, I'm going through all of the conversations in my conversation directory and I'm going through the file, and whenever I find a, a certain uh, name, I'm going to be translating it. Um, so this is, again, it, it's just something I wanted to give you as a point of reference. I could probably comment this code out for you guys so it doesn't give me bugs. But the whole idea here is that you, can, you don't have to type in those English terms one by one. You can create a system that will automatically go through all of your data, however it's being saved, and, and try to translate all those English terms. And the reason why I'm setting it to try to translate all those English terms is when it fails to translate, it is going to write it into a TXT that we can refer to later. And so that brings us to the translator document. And really the, the king method here is going to be translate. So let's jump right into that over here. And the first thing that I've done here in translate is I have just sort of created a little bit of debugging. This is a good place that I found just to catch some odd things that might happen in the code. So for example, if it's just a new line or if it's less than length two, any of this stuff, we're not gonna wanna translate it. We just send back the English text. Uh, likewise, if it starts with a less than sign, then if it has a line break, I do assert on that because I never wanna translate something that has a line break in it. Generally, I wanna translate line per line. So in general, I will assert on something like that. And then, what else is going on here? If we haven't loaded yet, we're going to just return the English text. And then, uh, you do have an option here to compare with case insensitivity. So for some computer programs that would make sense to do, to do so, you just change this to to lower. And there's another case where you'd have to replace that as well. But in my experience, I actually found for this particular game, it would be better to not have case insensitive comparisons. So in this case, I do keep... I retain whatever the default is. And I will note to you folks that the casing actually does matter when Google is doing its Google Translate because that is all a, a neural network and it is in some cases manually replaced by people. So the casing actually is important and that data should not be lost if you find its, inform its information that you need to know. So it, I would prefer if you don't do case insensitive. So, but it is the, an option if you want. Um, so what do we have here? So then it's going to check if it can translate it, and if it does, if it can, then it does. However, if it doesn't, then it's going to print us a warning which says there's no translation for text to lower, and it is going to call this helper method, which will add the string to a list of terms that we still need to translate. And that path is actually located on my computer, so I could actually pull that up for us now so you could see what that looks like. I might have it already. Yeah, here it is. So this is just a list of terms I have not translated. So somewhere in my game, I'm, I have lorem ipsum, which is just a placeholder text. 
and then some other to do text. So this is all the text that I have not yet updated. And so what you could do is try to translate all the text, have your game run into all those warning messages until you've created a huge text document, right? So when I originally did this, this text document was 1300 lines long. I copied the text document and I pasted that in for my English column. And that's actually how I started this spreadsheet. So you can use a similar principle of basically collecting all the terms you need to translate and then popping them into your CSV just like that. Now there's a few other methods here which we could walk through for you. Um, what else is going on here? I mean there's just some helper stuff like checking whether or not our current display language is English. Again, English is that negative one because it's the key. It's not in the value array. What else do we have here? Oh, and this is actually really important and probably Hmm. Okay, so I think this will probably be the last thing that we talk about uh, before we jump into the translate text node, which is the display language changed delegate. So there are two different ways that you can update something in code. The first is polling. And the way that polling works, it, right, this is a common interview question, is the way that polling works is basically you're constantly checking if something has changed. So that is usually how we do um, control systems. So for example, it's very often for you to have a update method that says input.getKey x to check if they've, text, uh, if they've uh, pushed the x button. That is an example of poding, polling because we're checking every frame. An alternative to polling is an event-driven system where we have something like a delegate, where in that case, we're not checking every time. Instead, we're telling it hey, when this happens, do this. And that's similar to whenever we have any sort of method delegate, like when we do on click dot add listener delegate, something like that for a button. This is what we've elected to do in this case. And what this allows us to do is any of the t text in our game that needs to be translated, we're going to give it a script that says, hey, this text needs to be translated. And uh, spoiler alert, that script is going to be called translate text, which we're going to be going over in just a second. But this translate text script is going to subscribe to the display language change delegate within your translator mono behavior. What that allows us to do is when we do choose to change the language, we can fire that delegate and any of our translate text uh, scripts inside of our game will now receive a notification that, hey, the display language has changed. And that will automatically inform all of those different text informations, all those different text displays, that they now need to change the language they're displaying. And so they'll automatically do that with this event-driven system. So it's really powerful for that reason. And let's actually jump into translate text now, where we could show you how that works. So I am using Text Mesh Pro which is probably the, the most popular version of the, the text system in Unity, but you could also use the default text system if you'd like. And the, the premise for this is you're gonna go in your scene and you're gonna look for all the text mesh pro objects or uh, T colon text if that's your case. So let's, uh, let's jump into the left-hand side here. You're gonna go, oh, what is this? What is this, we got a bug? Oh, of course. Yes, we have a bug because I just commented out that code for us. All right, so I'll uh, I'll uncomment it for now, but I'll well, we'll just leave it uncommented. But keep in mind, sorry, you're you're not going to have the uh, this stuff. You're probably not going to have the dialogue system inside your code base. So just be mindful that you could, will probably need to just remove that code or convert it to whatever the system is you're using. So let's jump back into Unity, and what you need to do is paste in here t colon text mesh pro ugui or t colon text if that's the version you're using. And then you're gonna wanna go to all of these texts. You know, you're just gonna basically mass highlight them like this. You're gonna scroll down, add component, and you're gonna add a translate text to all of them. And what that's going to allow you to do is all of your um, UGUIs are now gonna have that translate text component, so they're gonna automatically translate the text to whatever version you need. So I don't think all of mine have it, but most of them should have it. So in this case, hmm, let's see if this label does. All right, so this label, for example, has a translate text component on it. Okay, cool. And let's actually go into detail about what translate text does. Let's see if we could pull that up for us. Here we go. 
And translate text will have an init function. And let's pop some of these open. Init is uh, just a little paradigm I like to use where basically we have a bool that checks if it is initialized already. If it has initialized, we just return. But if it has not, then we do an initialization, which is basically a one-time thing. And normally, you'd want to have this in a start method. However, as you know, your code becomes a little bit more advanced, you're going to find that you want to initialize things before start. And sometimes you're going to want to initialize things after start. So it does help to have a separate initialization function, which again, with this bool, we can confirm will only fire once. And what else do we have here? We have a version that will be used from code. So if you ever want to manually set the text, as I may do in various examples, let's see. Um, here's a good example. So in this case, I want to grab a button called the new game button. I want to grab its translate text component, and I want to specify if it should show continue or I know it's behind my head, but this says new game. And so this is basically how you would call the set English text function. So it's a little useful for that. But the majority of the work is actually going to happen in the update text display. Now this update text display is subscribed to the display language change delegate, which means whenever you display, whenever you call the display language changed event, update display text or update text display will be called for all of the translate text in your scene. And what this will do is it will simply check uh, if it's initialized, it will then grab the translator, it will attempt to translate the text, and will display that translated text. Now there is a little bit of there's a little bit of a problem I ran into. Okay. The problem I ran into was I would load in the game, and then while the game was loading, I needed to download the translations. But if the game was downloading for a French player, I didn't know how to translate the text loading for French without having the translations, which I was in the process of downloading. So to solve that very specific edge case, I've come up with a, a little bit of a design in the code here where I have just manually written down what is the translation for the term loading. Okay, so for example, loading in English is of course loading, but in uh, Italian it's chargement. Or I, that probably doesn't sound Italian at all, but that is basically just a, a static um, or a constant uh, loading translation uh, array there. And so that is particularly useful if I don't yet have the translation set, but I do want to display the translations. Okay, so believe it or not, folks, that is actually the full tutorial. That is everything you're going to need to do in order to translate your game, covering the whole swath of how we're going to collect the, term, the translation terms list, then how we're going to upload it to a CSV, how we're going to populate that CSV, how we're going to download the CSV, how we're going to convert the CSV into at the terms data version, and then how during runtime we're going to update the translate text. So now I can actually show it to you in action. This is, this is uh, I'm currently working on this game, so it very well may crash on us, but let's, let's see if we can get this to run. We can, uh, we can check out what it looks like in, in game. Now, as I said, some of those were mono behaviors. Here, let's, uh, let's just pause that. I don't need it full screen for us right now. I have a director here, which has a translator game object. And that translator is keeping the translator and the translation loader in the game. Okay, that's basically a mono behavior. These don't have to be mono behaviors. You could definitely architect it so that's not the case. But uh, I think the overhead for a mono behavior is, is pretty insignificant, so I think it's fine. This is, of course, just an error from Unity because Unity is always broken, so they have lots of errors, and that's something you're going to have to live with, folks. So by default, it is English. But if we go to the Settings menu, we pop it into French. It is going to display that loading, right? It already knows what the translation is for loading because of that uh, static uh, array I showed you. And we can actually see the debug here. It started to download, and then approximately one second later, it had downloaded version 16, which is the version we just made together. And now the text, as you saw, was automatically translated. And actually, if I pop back into the settings menu, this is all translated as well automatically of course, because these all have the translate text mono behavior as a sister component to the uh, TextMesh Pro UGUI. Okay, so that is, that's how it works, folks. And once you download it, uh, translating from that point is super simple. It's not going to download it twice in one session. 
and it will translate all that stuff for you. Oh, you know what? This is actually a good tutorial for me to talk about um, different characters. So this is actually something a little unique. Your font, whichever font you chose for your game, probably does not support Chinese characters or Russian characters. Characters in, of course, the Chinese simplified alphabet or the Cyrillic alphabet, respectively. So uh, there's actually a little bit of work you'll need to do there, and I'd be happy to walk you through that if, if you are trying to translate in one of those uh, languages. So let me, um, let me show you now how that works. So TextMesh Pro actually makes this really easy. It used to be a total pain in the ass back uh, in the day, maybe version 2018, version 2019, version 2017. But with t version 2019 onwards, and I think as far as version 2018.3, we have had a much easier way to do that. So let me show you how that works. So first, you're going to need to find where your TextMesh Pro is. Hmm. OK, here it is, TextMesh Pro. And then the secret to how to do this is in your TextMesh Pro SDF asset. You're going to want to scroll down here. Here, let me pop up this inspector so it's a little bit larger for us to see. Let's pop this over here. You're going to want to scroll down all the way to fallback font assets. And that's where we're going to create a font asset for the different character sets that may not be supported by your default font. OK, so how, so the way that that works basically is it checks your font. It says, hey, do you have this character? So for example, maybe it's this, I, I don't know any Chinese characters, but it's a Chinese character, let's say, the one that looks like a little TP. Does it have the TP in your font asset? If no. It's going to then check each one of these fallback assets to check if it's inside there. So what we're going to create right now is I'm going to create I'm going to show you how to create some fallback assets. So for Chinese, what you basically need is a list of the character set you want to support. So the way to do that is I, I think there's actually a quick reference list. Hmm, let me see. So I, I think there's I've probably visited this page before. Here we go. Uh, Text Mesh Pro. Is that table of generic uh, standard Chinese characters? So this is this is just something I found while Googling, but it actually does have these text documents for all of the most common characters. And so th the way that the importer works basically is you have to say what characters do you want to import, and so it helps to have a uh, a document like this. This is actually the hex code for the Unicode format of all the different uh, characters you need. So what you would do is you would and I'll just show it you for the common one, but obviously I've done this for common one, common two, and uncommon. You're going to copy or cut all of those characters. Okay, oh, so you can see I've done that here. So I've created Chinese characters three, two, and one. And what you're going to do is you're going to copy all those characters. It's basically just hex codes. Then you're going to go here to your window, Text Mesh Pro, Font Asset Creator, and you're going to need to choose a font that definitely includes those characters. So your, your fancy font might not, but you're going to want one that does. And I, I would recommend going to Google Fonts. So Google Fonts. And you just want to search in here whatever language you want to support. So if you want to support Chinese Simplified, then maybe Nodo Sans SC is the right, text, uh, is the right uh, fallback font for you. So you want to download this font. And I believe I actually have that font here. So Noto Sans, and so you would select that. And then in the Unicode range here, you're going to paste all of the different characters that you want to support. So that's what we just copied from that text document. Or you could actually include a range. So for the Cyrillic alphabet, I included a range, which I found online. But in the case of the Chinese, you just paste in that version. And so you would paste that in, click Generate Font Asset. Um, it may take some time, but this has actually been pretty fast for me recently. OK, all right, everything's going crazy. We're reloading some scripts for some reason. Um, this is actually, uh, and so now you want to look at it, OK? And so that is actually really hard to read, OK? It's a little bit blurry. And so you're, you do want to pump up the size until it is a version that you can read. So I just pumped it up to 4,096 by 4,096. And let's see how that looks. Let's take a peek at that. OK, so now, now you can actually see it's not as blurry. It looks a little blurry on your screen, but on my screen, it's looking a little bit better. And so you are going to need to fine tune that to find what's a good balance for you. Or you could even you know, chop all these terms off, 
right? Maybe cut it in half or something like that and create a separate, you know, if, I, if I'm only using this restrained character set, then obviously it's, it's going to need a lot less space. So I might even be able to fall back to 1,000 here. No, oh, not quite. Maybe 2,000 would be better. But you want, you want it to be easy to read. And what I've actually done is I've separated it into Chinese 1, Chinese 2, Chinese 3. So they don't all need to be one font asset. As you saw in my example, I had multiple fallbacks. And of course, version control is going crazy here as I edit all this stuff. But um, where was I? Okay, yeah, if you, if you open up that inspector, which is for some reason not showing now, um, you're going to just set the, yeah, I, oh, okay. It's being a little silly for me for some reason. But you're going to want to set those fallback assets here in that section. You're just going to drag it in. Okay, so a little bonus tutorial I added in there for our friends who are translating for Chinese and Russian and all that other um, Hebrew, what have you, all these exciting um, character sets. Whatever you need, we can do it. Um, I'd love to pause for a moment now for folks who are still with us in this video and discuss some of the trade-offs with this system. You know, Whenever you're creating a system like this, there are going to be positives and negatives. So let's discuss some of those now. This system downloads a version from the internet. And as I explained to you, that's actually a really good thing because we don't need a ship with a version in the file. We don't need a ship with a translation database in the, in the game proper. However, I would highly recommend you consider doing so anyway. And so this, this system has not been created for that, but it may be prudent for you to ship the game with a CSV, maybe version one, just so that even if they, if they download it and then they decide that they never want to play it until they are on an airplane, that way you don't run into a problem because this game will require you to play it at least once with an internet connection to download it. However, if you do ship it with a CSV from the beginning, it, it, it can just reference that. So you'll never be caught in a situation where you have not yet downloaded the translations. So that's something to be mindful of and an, op an opportunity for you to, to fix this. And if you do, definitely send me that code. I'd, I'd love to get that fixed. The other thing that we should mention is, in general, the way string hashing works is it, it works best if you have a very short string to hash. So in this case, I have this entire sentence that is the key for our dictionary. It would be probably a lot better if you could instead say mozi-dialogue-1, and that is your key. And then in the next column is the English, the French, the Spanish, right? Rather than having English be the index, you would have some sort of... Um, something that looks a little bit more like a key, like I just showed, some sort of character sequence that is uniquely identifiable, but hopefully much less long than the actual English translation. I would highly recommend you do that just because in general, you don't want to be hashing raw text. So I, I think it would be prudent to look at that as an optimization as well, as a way to improve. Anything else? Uh, hmm. I think that about wraps it up. If there's any other limitations of the system that you encounter, um, or that you think of. I'd love to hear your, your perspective, advice. Um, as always, I learn as much from these videos as I, I hope that you're learning from them. And I, I really have a great appreciation for the community we've been able to foster on YouTube in speaking about Unity and other game development engines because I would love to continue building systems like this and, and hearing your feedback to make this the best it could be. And of course, as always, if there is a YouTube tutorial another concept of game development that might be a little bit tricky like localization that you want me to break down for you and give you example code for i'd be happy to do that so please just list any of those requests in the comment section below if you have a problem with this code pop it in the comment section below and if you feel pretty confident you feel like you understand this stuff pretty well check out that comment section and see if there's anybody else who you can help out maybe in answering some of their questions all right good luck and I wish uh, if you make a game with this system, definitely send it to me. I'd love to play it. All right. Catch you guys in the next one. Bye.